Hello, I'm Larry Levitt from KFF. Welcome to the latest episode of the Health Wonk Shop. About once a month, we dive into timely and complex health policy topics with experts from a variety of perspectives. One thing we've seen in recent years is that courts have increasingly played a role in health policy. Just look at the number of cases related to the Affordable Care Act as evidence, including the very consequential decision by the Supreme Court to make Medicaid expansion effectively optional for states. Just recently, in the so-called Loper-Bright decision, the US Supreme Court overturned what's known as the Chevron defense to federal agencies. Neither Chevron nor Loper-Bright have anything to do with health care, but this decision could have big implications for health policy. We could see more legal challenges to federal health regulations, federal regulators may get more cautious, and Congress might try to get more prescriptive, which may or may not be successful. We have four lawyers on today to discuss what a post-Chevron world will mean for health policy. Uh, but rest assured, this is not going to be a law school class, uh, which I feel fortunate for is the only non-attorney uh, on the, on the, in the group. Uh, these are all experts in policy, rulemaking, and legislating. Our plan is to look at what a post-Chevron world might look like for healthcare policymaking. Cindy Mann is partner at Manat Health and former deputy administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Dean Rosen is a partner at Melman Consulting and former chief healthcare advisor to Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist. Kay Pastena is vice president at KFF and director of our program on patient and consumer protection. And Lori Sobel is associate director of KFF's Women's Health Policy Program. I haven't added it up, but I'm pretty sure we collectively have well over a century of experience here. A little bit of housekeeping before we jump in. Uh, if you have questions, submit them at any time through the Q&A button in Zoom. I promise we'll get to as many of them as we can. Also note that this session is being recorded and an archived version should be available later today. So Kate, let me start with you to kind of level set the discussion. Uh, what actually was the Chevron deference? Uh, and is there a new standard that the Supreme Court has now established in overturning it? Thank you. Um, yeah, Chevron deference uh, was a framework that federal courts used to make decisions when certain federal regulations were challenged in court. Um, and it came from a 1984 case called Chevron versus National Natural Resource Defense Council. Um, and under the Chevron deference framework, federal courts were to give deference to a reasonable agency interpretation of a law. Uh, when the agency was interpreting either an unclear or ambiguous provision in a law or an issue in which the law was silent. So that meant that federal courts would defer to an agency regulation that a court might, that a court found to be reasonable, even if there were other reasonable interpretations of that a provision that a judge might thought think were, were a better interpretation of the law. But nevertheless, the court had to uphold that agency regulation unless it found that somehow it was arbitrary or inconsistent with the statute. So basically, not every challenge to a federal regulation implicated Chevron. Uh, for instance, there are certainly some disputes on agency regulations that don't involve ambiguous language, or there are some laws that specifically um, delegate to agencies decision, certain decisions. But for those scenarios where Chevron deference was relevant, it was a foundational concept in administrative law that was used for over 40 years. Um, and definitely over those 40 years, there were policy debates over whether Chevron deference was the right approach. Um, opponents often argued that unelected agency regulators shouldn't uh, be making the final, have the final word on certain decisions and that it undermined the separation of powers under the Constitution by giving executive branch um, folks um, authority, more authority than some thought they should. Um, on the other hand, proponents of Chevron deference um, argue that federal agencies are, the, are best suited for this role um, as they are tasked with implementing the law and that they are the sub subject matter experts um, knowledgeable of the data and the policy nuances needed to make decisions and are ultimately accountable through of an elected president. In recent years, the Supreme Court itself has rarely relied on Chevron in evaluating agency regulations, 
But it nevertheless, Chevron deference was still precedent that was followed by lower federal courts until the court overruled Chevron in the Loper Bright decision. So that's that's what Chevron deference was. Um, is there a new standard now that uh, we have the Loper Bright decision? The, the short answer is is no. Um, in overruling Chevron, the court, Justice Roberts speaking for the majority, basically said. Chevron deference runs counter to the Administrative Procedure Act, the APA. That's a, a law that sets parameters for federal administrative processes. Um, and according to the Roberts opinion, under the APA, it is courts that decide legal uh, questions by applying their own independent judgment and not deferring to agencies when resolving um, issues around ambiguities in laws. And that it's up to courts to decide the best interpretation of the law for, for these challenges and that agencies don't have any particular competence to resolve statutory ambiguities, so, uh, quote from the, from the opinion. Um, but the, there's no new framework on how courts are to exercise this independent judgment or to make the best reading. So that's where we are. We have to see how lower courts take um, that new decision in Loper. And there is some language in the, in the opinion, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about today, that might give some wiggle room that might give agencies some discretion, and I'll leave that to discussion. Um, well, I think we're in for quite a ride. Uh, thanks, Kay. Uh, Cindy, let me turn to to you. So you, uh, uh, when you were sitting at CMS, wrote a lot of rules, or your people wrote a lot of rules. Um, how, I mean, get in the head of someone who's sitting there in a federal healthcare uh, agency. Uh, how do you think this is going to affect the rulemaking process? Oops, Cindy, I think you're on mute. You have to learn this. Is that better? Sorry. Um, I do think it'll have a quite a significant impact um, uh, in, in the short run. And I think how big the impact will be uh, depends on some of the issues that, that Kay, uh, Kay raised. Certainly, um, agencies and their general counsels, their leadership will be uh, more cautious about undertaking rulemaking more cautious about changing their rules over time um, and more exhaustive in drafting rules and the just agency justifications for those rules, which um, uh, which are required in, in under the APA and rulemaking, um, but which um, have gotten more and more extensive over time. Um, and additionally, in a case that, that um, has gotten less attention, the court was very explicit that agencies are supposed to respond point by point to every comment that's raised in the course of rulemaking. But that said, as, as Kay notes, um, this has been the trend over the last several years. So I wouldn't say it's a bright light uh, line change. Um, but a confirmation of a trend that we've been seeing um, as we've seen more courts abandon um, the Chevron deference or, or doctrine, not use it at least, and, uh, and the appointment of judges that are more inclined to move in a direction of affording federal agencies less, um, less deference. Um, but, but as we think about both the, the short term and the longer term impact of Loper Bright, I think uh, we should be thinking also that there may be even more impact to the extent that it spreads to other areas of this, uh, agency rulemaking. So, for example, I want to point out two examples. Um, one is we have statutes, um, and this is certainly true in the Medicaid statute, which um, I have become closely, uh, intimately familiar with, uh, where the statute explicitly gives the state, uh, gives the agency discretion um, to make rules in an area. Um, that wasn't the case in Loper Bright, um, but Medicare and Medicaid, um, there's been lots of delegations of authority, sometimes very specific, like Congress says, the secretary shall establish rules to uh, determine income eligibility. Um, and sometimes very general, which, uh, for example, the, the statute says that Congress shall use, uh, the state shall use administration methods of administration found by the secretary to be necessary for the proper and efficient administration of the program. Um, in other areas, uh, there may not be a specific delegation of authority, but it's clear 
um, that if Congress's intent is going to be actualized, there needs to be some more details. For example, the statute says in Medicaid that rates paid to managed care plans should be actuarially sound, a concept that is clear as mud. So CMS uh, regularly issues regulations and guidance to states on how to come up with a methodology for determining actuarial soundness. So Robert's opinion says courts should respect at least explicit delegations of authority. He doesn't talk uh, much in the, in the case about um, uh, those, those, those need to fill in the gap, um, but it's really unclear what that, what that actually means. And we would be, I think, ignoring recent trends and articulated concerns in some circles um, about the administrative state if we weren't alert, alert to the possibility of lots more litigation, lots more questions coming at us, and that in turn, going back to your question, Larry, will uh, make even now some of the agencies and their councils uh, more reluctant, more concerned, more cautious about moving forward. Thanks, Cindy. Um, so, Dean, let's um, switch to the uh, other branch of government, <laughs> Congress, uh, which you've been very involved with for, for years. Um, you know, there's kind of two sides to this coin. There's the 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 rulemaking, and then there's the statutory side, as as Cindy was was talking about. Um, so, from your work on the Hill o over the years, I mean, what do you think this is going to do to to legislating? Uh, will Congress be successful in adding uh, details and clearer delegation, as as uh, you know, Cindy laid out, um, or or is that going to be hard for Congress to to actually accomplish? Yeah, well, thank you, and and thanks again, Larry, and everyone for for having me join. I, I think, uh, you know, I think that's the fundamental question when it comes to legislation. As as I think about the case, I think there there are sort of two sets of questions. One is um, what current laws and regulations on the books will be challenged going forward, and the second question, um, you know, relating to what you asked specifically is. How will future legislation be impacted? And I think it is, as both Kay and Cindy's conversations um, raised, I, I think, you know, part one is what about all these regulations that are already on the books? And I, I know we'll probably get into some dialogue around the impact of those in healthcare. But to me, that's that's sort of the first question. Where is there clear um, uh, current delegation or clear uh, specificity in, in the statute? With respect to your specific question about moving forward, um, I think it will make uh, I think it will make legislation more challenging potentially. There's no question, at least in some areas. Um, I, I remember when I was um, uh, a young staff person on the Hill about 120 years ago. Uh, I was in a committee um, executive session. We were marking up legislation, and a, and a senator offered an amendment that was that was very very vague. And it passed the committee um, unanimously, and the senator said, um, you know, uh, was kind of congratulated for getting his amendment passed. And he said, uh, you know, w we wouldn't have had any unanimity without ambiguity. And and I think that that's true often of how Congress does go about things. It's clearly a negotiating strategy. Let's leave this a little. Let's leave this a little bit vague. So it, it the specificity in some cases to your question will, I think, make it harder. Uh, I think it's also going to pose pragmatic challenges uh, for some of the, 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 the things that Cindy commented on, which is just uh, we're going to have courts who are now sitting and, and making judgments, but you're going to have Congress a lot of the time where they're not just trying to punt for political reasons, but they're legitimately punting because they don't know the answer, and they won't know the answer until stakeholders weigh in in a regulatory process that's more specific. So I think there will be um, some political challenges to, to getting agreement because of the specificity requirements that are clearly going to emanate from the case. And I think there will be some pragmatic challenges in just, you know, these members of Congress who are not detailed experts on things like, you know, actuarial value or, or, or other things in the future, um, you know, writing the regulations. The last thing I'll say is I, I do think that um, it will put a, a premium to me on, uh, on on bipartisan legislation or legislation where 
a, we have one side that has a, a, a bigger majority. Things we haven't seen very much in the last couple of Congresses. We're at a 51-49 Senate right now and one of the closest House majorities in history, for example. Um, and so, you know, if you're going to go about legislating in the future and you need to get to some level of specificity, it will be more likely, I think, to occur where there's more general agreement about direction and where the agencies are involved, as Cindy was in her past job in providing technical assistance directly to the legislation as it's being written. So there'll be a, a, a priority, I think, uh, on those areas. So a lot to be seen. Uh, but I think, as your question implies, in some areas, particularly around challenging, more partisan, more uh, technical areas, I, I think there will be more more difficulty legislating in the future. Dean, let me just ask a quick follow up. Um, I mean, you mentioned, uh, I mean, some of these areas are very complicated, right? I mean, they're not just, I mean, they're they're technically complicated, like defining actuarial actuarially sound rates for Medicaid managed care plans. But then they're politically complicated as well, with lots of stakeholders involved, as you as you suggested. Um, how do you how do you see the role of congressional staff potentially changing in in this kind of environment uh, as well? Uh, I mean, the members of Congress are the ones who are out front, uh, but we do know that staff play a big role behind the scenes, kind of working out these details. Yeah, no, I I think there's already been some preliminary conversations among um, some of the folks that I talk to, you know, all the time about, well, do we need to um, do we need to hire a different kind of staff person? Do we need to uh, provide some additional budget for maybe a different kind of advisory? Uh, you know, as you know, and others who've worked on Capitol Hill, um, staff people have a lot of support already. They have technical support from uh, from from legal experts called legislative counsel that help with the actual drafting. They have uh, expertise and input from uh, you know folks like the Joint Tax Committee or Congressional Budget Office to help refine legislation. But I I, I think to your follow up, um, it could put more of a uh, an emphasis on on having staff, on hiring staff, on on looking at staff that bring that kind of additional expertise or at least are able to. Uh, bring in technical guidance from agency experts, again, like Cindy was, or legal experts internally. And it could also put more, uh, it, you know, I've seen some articles on this too. It could also put more pressure on on outside or, or importance on outside, you know, advocates and lobbyists like me and others to provide those kinds of things as as they're as they're seeking legislation or changes to legislation. Great. Um, so, Lori, let me bring you in. Um, uh, you know, one area where uh, we've already seen <laughs> uh, um, the the lack of the Chevron deference uh, already be implicated in cases is in reproductive health uh, and family planning, um, in, in particular, and and non discrimination in in healthcare. Um, we talk a little bit about what these uh, uh, these cases are and. Um, Kind of where you see this playing out in particular around reproductive health access. Sure. Thanks, Larry. I think um, to Dean's point, Title 10 is one of the examples where the language is ambiguous because that's what was able to get passed. So the section in Title 10 that is always um, sort of back and well, historically, this language has been interpreted to include, the, let me let, say what the language is, Section 1008, um, which is definitely ambiguous, is that no federal funding appropriated under the program, which is again, Title 10, the federal family planning program, shall be used in a program where abortion is a method of family planning. And so throughout the history of the program, this language has been interpreted to in regulations to include counseling and non-directive, uh, non-directive counseling and referral for abortion, except under the Reagan administration and um, under the Trump administration. The Reagan administration regulations, which prohibited the counseling and the referrals, was actually litigated all the way to the Supreme Court in a case called Russ v. Sullivan. And the Supreme Court ruled under Chevron that the, that section of the statute was ambiguous, and the court deferred to the agency's interpretation. So the question today is, well, you know, the, the Roberts decision said, well, we're going to not relitigate everything that has already been litigated. But it was the opposite of what the Biden administration regulations are now, which require the counseling and referrals to be done under Title X that was upheld by the court as an acceptable reading. 
So this is playing out right now in litigation that's ongoing. The Biden administration, which requires the counseling and the referrals, um, has taken away funding from Oklahoma and Tennessee saying, you're not willing to do this. The states are actually the grantees under the program. And the state says, we're not going to provide this type of services. We're not going to provide counseling and we're not going to provide referrals to people who ask for abortion services. And it's played out differently in both of those cases. In Oklahoma, the, um, the court said, you know, you took this money knowing what the rules were. So sorry, but like this Loper Bright doesn't change that. Last week in um, the Sixth Circuit, there was a robust discussion about whether Loper Bright changes this um, and whether this should be re- relitigated. Like the state is, Tennessee is arguing, well, you know, this is not a reasonable reading and this is not the best reading, which is really what the, a court would substitute their reading of this for the agency's reading. And so the court should decide what the best reading is. And so this is one of those cases where it's very um, unclear whether the underlying regulations will be relitigated, um, even though they were litigated under the Reagan administration regulations. With regard to 1557, again, this is another area. This is 1557 is the of the Affordable Care Act bars discrimination based upon age, disability, race, national origin, color, or sex by any healthcare program or activity that receives federal funding. So every one of those terms needs some defining, um, in especially the last part, by any healthcare program or activity. What does that mean in terms of funding? Is it anybody who gets any federal money? Is How, how broad is that? And this is another area where regulations have changed from each administration. And the Biden administration has issued regulations that include sexual orientation and general gender identity in the definition of sex, um, which is now being challenged. And most recently, um, there's been a flurry of activity that has been citing Loper Bright. And right now, there's a nationwide injunction now in place blocking the Biden administration's regulation defining sex to include gender identity. And then... I was going to mention medication abortion, but we can hold that if you want to hold that. Yeah, why don't we, why don't we come come back to that. Um, I want to pick up on uh, something Lori talked about, which is, uh, you know, these cases where we see regulations flipping back and forth from uh, administration to administration, whether it's 1557 non-discrimination rules or family planning funding and the, the rules surrounding that. Um, and, you know, we we think of Chevron as uh, or overturning Chevron as something that's been pushed by uh, by, by industry to sort of um, you know, reduce federal uh, regulation and reduce the power of agencies. Um, but, uh, you know, th- th- this could play in both directions uh, uh, with different ad- administrations. Uh, is Cindy, you know, talk a little bit, particularly in Medicaid. Um, you know, we've seen uh, Democratic administrations try to be active in using uh, regulatory authority to uh, make changes in Medicaid. But we've seen conservative administrations try to make changes as well. How, how do you see that playing playing out here? So I think it, it partly goes back to the discretion question that, that I touched upon earlier um, and whether the statute really gives the agency the authority to do that um, um, and whether that interpretation is reasonable. Um, and um, there, you know, to the extent that there is discretion and expertise, and an agency can lay that out clearly and thoughtfully and uh, reasonably, um, it, it, you could have switching back and forth. But I think the Loper Bright decision is very clear that um, uh, that when agencies go back and forth in their determination, that um, there will be much less deference. Um, to their interpretation of what the law requires, because the law hasn't changed back and forth. Um, so I do think those situations are um, um, are more vulnerable. That being said, sort of going back to what Kay said, it's like, then what standard do you apply? Because as, as Lori said, <laughs> the words don't uh, jump out at your page. And um, and I think the point made is, uh, is really right, that there's legislation that's done where the Congress not only cannot anticipate all of the nuances, so wants an agency to fill in the details, but doesn't want to fill in the details and can't get political agreement about the details. You know, one one other issue I just want to flag that comes up in Medicaid, um, which 
also presents conundrums potentially for 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 um, uh, for those who are writing statutes is there are federal standards in federal, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a federalism program, right? States have lots of discretion to do things, uh, but subject to certain national standards. Um, and, and so it's a mix. So what happens when the agency promulgates regulations about those national standards, which of course it will do from time to time, and then different states um, uh, litigate it in different, you know, with different judges. And, um, you know, maybe the issue will rise back to the Supreme Court and they'll adjudicate it to the nation as a whole. But what you can well see is this notion of a patchwork of decisions that are very different and what then happens to what Congress wanted to have happen very clearly, which is that there will be some national standards that, that undergrid the discretion that states have. Um, so, so we've had a, uh, we have a lot of questions and I want to get to them. Um, had a number of questions about, you know, what, is, what is the scope here? We've talked a lot about, uh, you know, formal rulemaking, um, yeah, where there's a whole process, um, for, um, uh, issuing rules, uh, determining statutory authority, responding to comments from the public. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of other things that federal agencies do. Um, you know, in Medicaid, there are approvals of of waivers, which are not formal regulations. Um, there are FAQs. There's guidance. Um, you know, we know under the, the ACA, it, it's driven me crazy, but there are, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of FAQs across several agencies that you, you have to sort through. Um, Kay, let me turn to you. So, so uh, do those all f fall under this um, you know, this this kind of uh, non-deference to, to federal agencies as well? I mean, can there be litigation over FAQs or, or guidance? Well, typically we're talking about the agency's final word on a topic or an issue. So we tend to think about just final regulations as being the topic, and that's usually what it is. But we certainly seen courts look at some guidance and um, deem it similar to a final regulation, final word on something. So it's possible that some, we call it some regulatory guidance, might um, also get some scrutiny. But I think there's also the argument that we might see agencies look to kind of non-binding best practices, um, sub-regulatory, you know, advice um, in the absence as kind of a more strategic way to get information out uh, about uh, a new requirement. Um, so... And, there's some argument that you might see more so regulatory guidance, even though we've already seen a lot of it. Um, but no, courts can also look at the guidance and and deem it the final word and say, you know, um, you we're not going to really give it any any deference, certainly, but not even look at it. Um, some I, my I'm reminded of a recent case where they were looking at some new HIPAA rules with respect to. Um, um, tracking software, um, and they deemed some guidance from HHS as Office of Civil Rights um, as the final word and as binding, as binding, and basically um, said that that the agency had got, kind of gone beyond its authority to to require agency to requirement to require regulated entities to comply with it. So, yeah, I think we're going to see more guidance, uh, sub regulatory guidance, and when we might also see more kind of deemed as a final rule, but. Larry, can, you, can I add things to? I I, I think that um, your your the question in case comments uh, triggered two things for me. One is, you know, there there's various different kinds of guidance. I mean, on the one hand, you may get you know a CMS um, saying, you know, here's some best practices for enrollment under Medicaid in the states, and that's you know a lot of what we think about as guidance. I'm I'm thinking about a number of things that I'm working on. Uh, currently, that 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 other HHS um, sub agencies have put out. I mean, I've seen the FDA uh, basically come up with you know guidance that's really a, a regulatory scheme that's not just like hey, you may want to think about this or this is an interpretation, but it's really fundamentally in some cases changed the way that 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 various different um, uh, devices or drugs uh, are are delivered. So. 
I, I think to Kay's point, there there's going to very likely be challenges in the future because again, this isn't self, uh, you know, uh, actuating. Uh, there's going to be challenges in the future to a number of things that are that are that are guidance that that rise to with the level of what people feel are are effectively re regulations. The, the second point I wanted to make on the APA, and I think there's been a lot less coverage about this, but um, but I think it's important, it goes hand in hand with it. There was another decision uh, this term in July in a case called, uh, or late June, in a case called Corner Post, which um, I think you almost have to read, at least with respect to APA challenges in the future, as going hand in hand, which the Supreme Court said something that, that I think was was not dictated as much as we sort of knew where Chevron was going because of past rulings. But in Corner Post, they basically said that uh, the effective date, the statute of limitations effectively for an APA case was not six years from a final regulation, but six years from the date that it that it had an impact on an injured plaintiff. Meaning, back to my point originally, that, that you could have uh, regulations that have been on the books for years and years and years, but when they're applied to a new class or a new plaintiff entity, they could be challenged anew. And I think that's an important point um, not in the broader scope of guidance, but on the APA challenges that I think we will see specifically that you have to, I think, read corner post hand in hand with Loper Bright. Yeah, I mean, so that, that opens up just an enormous number of, of regulations from many, many years ago to to potential uh, legal challenge. Um, Laurie, let me bring you back in. Uh, D Dean mentioned a couple of things here. One is uh, uh, corner post and this issue of kind of reopening uh, decisions from from quite a while ago, uh, and then the second was the FDA. Uh, um, so I want to come back to uh, medication abortion, which you were starting to to talk about. So you know that that's being litigated now, the FDA's uh, uh, approval um, of medication abortion at various times. Um, I mean. Was Chevron implicated in that challenge, or could it now be implicated, particularly along with Corner Post, uh, in a, in a new challenge? Well, I think to Dean's point, Corner Post definitely opens up, you know, a new set of challenges for particularly for the approval of Mifepristone, which was approved in the year two thousand. Um, as we know, the plaintiffs that that litigated most recently were a newly formed group, and so they could claim that their injury was new. Um, much like in Corner Post. Um, whether Loberbright opens the door to the court second guessing the FDA's decision approving drugs based upon scientific evidence is not really quite clear. So the court noted that agency um, fact finding and policy making decisions would be considered under substantial evidence and, and arbitrary and capricious standard. But it's possible that a future court would entertain potentially conflicting evidence that's brought by um, plaintiffs to say, like, well, the FDA didn't quite look at, at this or that. So, I mean, a, a decision approving a drug is a final agency decision. And um, I think in the past, you know, the court has never overturned a drug decision. But I think we might see we're definitely there's challenges ongoing around mifepristone and whether the court delves into the evidence that the FDA used to base their decision to approve mifepristone and change the rules around its dispensing is, is yet to be seen. It's, it's an open question, I think. Um, Cindy, so we, we've had a, a, a number of questions and, and several of you have raised this issue of, uh, of states <laughs> and how they relate to all this. And Medicaid's a perfect example as a as a federalism uh program um so you know a lot of what happens in cms's relationship with states uh are, are again not these formal regulations so i'm thinking of medicaid waivers uh for example uh you know and one that's been very contentious but that was very contentious under the trump administration and was certainly litigated is uh, work requirements under medicaid and there have been um renewed proposals uh to to do that um how do you see this playing out with these Medicaid waivers? And you, and you mentioned the possibility of potentially, you know, different kind of structures or rules that could apply in different parts of the country as as litigation occurs in different regions. So um, on Medicaid waivers in particular and the work requirement waivers, which was this, um, 
which is and was a hot issue and, and was, uh, and again, continues to be litigated. Um, the courts have pretty much not relied on Chevron as they reviewed the, the challenges to those waivers. They have gone right in and do what the Supreme Court said you should do. They have not found the statute ambiguous, let's put it that way. So they found the statute as uh, saying, you know, what the primary objectives of the Medicaid program were, and then relied on the APA to say, well, the, the agency needs to grapple with that and needs to have a, uh, a thoughtful way of, of, of explaining how this waiver, in fact, uh, promotes the objectives of the statute. So I think we'll continue to see a lot of uh, contention and litigation around waivers, but I think Chevron hasn't um, directly um, uh, affected that um, because for the most part, Chevron really does has been applied to situations of notice and comment. When there's a regulation with notice and comment, not so much sub-regulatory guidance, and it hasn't come up as much in the waiver world. But I, but I do want to just say something about states because states are states are um, different things depending upon who we're talking about, right? There's governors and there's legislators and then there's you know state Medicaid programs uh, and and the leadership in those programs. And if there's one thing I think that state Medicaid programs um, want, um, and they have you know a long wish list and it's not uniform, but what's pretty uniform is they want to know what the rules are. Um, they want to have some certainty. Um, they want to be able to promulgate their rules. They want to be able to have contracts with their health plans. They want to be able to um, uh, set up their IT system so that it effectuates what the rules are. For all sorts of reasons, they need some certainty um, in this. And I think this uh, 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 Loper Bright and, and potentially its progeny um, really uh, create a lot of uncertainty. Um, and the corner post case also really adds to that as, as people have identified because litigation can just happen. If a new entity comes on the scene and says, oh, I'm here and I think that regulation that you promulgated 15 years ago is a real problem. Um, so we've also had a lot of questions about uh, kind of what this means for judges. Um, I mean, Dean talked about, um, you know, the expertise that Congress may need in in writing statutes, but um, uh, judges, I mean, the 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 whole point here is judges may exercise their own um, uh, judgments uh, and not necessarily defer to, to federal agencies where statutes are, are unclear or ambiguous. Um, so, Kay, as far as I know, uh, I don't think we have any current litigators on on the call, but uh, Kay, I know, you know, one area that's been very complex in litigation is ERISA, for example. Um, you know, and in, incredibly, uh, not, not that long a, a statute, but incredibly complicated. Um, how, uh, kind of, how do you think about this, this, um, uh, you know, from what you've seen in, in previous cases, how, how, how do you think about this need for judges to now understand, you know, potentially very, very complicated, uh, uh, areas of regulation? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned judges and ERISA, I think. A lot of judges often joke. It's like if you're the lowest on the totem pole and they give you the ERISA case, the judges don't want to deal with that statute. It's complicated. Um, and, um, you know, uh, lower courts have to take the cases in front of them. And so, um, and to the extent that very technical issues require more, their independent judgment and more time, um, even judges, um, might be overwhelmed <laughs> with what they have to address, and they may not be able to do a, we call it de novo review for every type of thing that they see, and particularly ERISA claims uh, issues for which actually today they uh, um, um, give deference to the insurer's decision often. Um, but um, for judges and litigants, um, well, we're already starting to see more ERISA litigation um, and so that's kind of a continuation, whether we had Loper Bright or not, we're starting to see um, folks ask questions about who is a fiduciary in, on the healthcare side, things like what is full and fair review? That's an ERISA term for uh, uh, claims and appeals review. And what about the use of artificial intelligence and um, standards with respect to prior authorization for our behavioral health? So we're already in the kind of in it with ERISA. And judges are are going to be are not going to be able to ignore it, um, and so 
you know, we're just, we're going to see, for better or for worse, a lot more digging, digging in on things that maybe regulated entities in the ERISA space have been used to not having to deal with. So even judges won't be able to ignore it. Um, so Dean, we had a number of questions about uh, the effect of CMS regulatory actions, particularly in Medicare, um, on industry, whether it's hospital payment, physician payment, um, uh, now the the uh, Medicare drug price negotiation uh, process. Um, do, do you do you see this as a potential opening for uh, industry to to kind of fight back about uh, against CMS decisions? You know, whether it's hospitals or or drug companies um, around the adequacy of the negotiated prices or the the uh, you know hospital hospital prices. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly think that that it, it provides a, a potential for some of the um, cases that have been brought on constitutional grounds in the drug pricing area to maybe be thought about being relitigated on these grounds or future cases. Um, you know, that might argue an APA violation. Uh, we we just saw one with respect to uh, some of the the risk scores in the Medicare Advantage area that was successful that that maybe they add a a loper bright um you know deference claim to it um or cases that may have been brought and i think Kay, you referenced this a little bit earlier on on you know unconstitutional um uh, deference of authority uh or delegation of authority so i think you may see this added um you know and i would i would almost bring cindy into the discussion too though i know is the medicaid side and and uh and Lori and others, but I think a lot of the Medicare payment rules, there's um, th there is some level of of actual, you know, uh, authority. There's some non-reviewability of some of those uh, determinations, and and I think this this is a great example of sort of the pragmat pragmatic places too, which is you know you you write the Medicare physician payment rules a decade ago, um, and there's by definition supposed to take into consideration changes in the current market, changes in in things like uh, margins and other things. Uh, so I, I I think in the Medicare area there may be specific payment areas, um, and again we'll see. But there may be less challenges to specific rates, but there may be more challenges to things that involve coverage. Uh, or where there's an intermingling of coverage and rates. Um, I don't know. I think Kay said earlier there's not a new framework here. So this is a little bit like a statement as a, a Loper Bright as opposed to a, a specific roadmap. And I think we're all going to be sort of following along this roadmap for the next several years and maybe several decades. But my sense is, and I'd invite some of the other expert panelists to comment here too, is that some of the strict payment uh, regulations under Medicare may be less challengeable for those reasons than some that, that mingle coverage or involve coverage or some of the Medicaid areas that Cindy mentioned. Uh, and Dean, let me stay with you for a sec, because we also had a question about, you know, is there uh, is there a boilerplate language that Congress can now use to, uh, to you know, immunize um, uh, statutes uh, against challenges uh, without the Chevron deference? Um, you know, is there, and you mentioned, for example, the Medicare payment rules, which in some cases, you know, have non-reviewability, have very kind of specific delegation authority. Uh, I mean, are you aware of discussions about, you know, how to develop develop language that, that will be more effective at making, um, uh, making things uh, immune to, to challenge? Yeah, I, I, I think in the very early stages of discussions, things like non-renewability, -re explicit delegation, delegation with parameters are all the kinds of things that that I think will be as a uh, kind of a rule of thumb included. I think the challenge becomes again, I mean, we're talking, you know, a, a wide range of different kinds of even healthcare rules from, uh, you know, uh, FDA approvals here to Medicaid waiver approvals to Medicare rules. And those are all really, really different. And so, I, you know, I think it's going to be hard to come up with a single uh, template or a number of things that the legislative council and staff can just kind of pull off the shelf and say we're good, we're good here. Uh, so I think it's a I think it's a good question. I think there will be some 
mechanisms that that likely develop over time as you see um, Congress really trying to protect uh, a legislation, just as we've seen things like, you know, severability and other things being used as standard form. Um, but I think in some of these cases, it, there's such a diversity of potential laws and regulations that it's it's also going to be difficult. Um, so we're uh, unfortunately coming to the, <laughs> the end of our time, um, you know, and we've uh, touched on a lot of issues. I don't think we resolved uh, anything. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, in fact, as as I think all of you said, uh, you know, uncertainty is is the uh, is the word here. I mean, we don't we don't know exactly uh, what's to come. Uh, I want to just take a, a minute and give you, each of you to, um, you know, talk about um well, you could talk about either uh, what you are most concerned about, um, what area of, of rulemaking or legislating uh, you're most worried might be vulnerable vulnerable here, or or what you're potentially optimistic about. Um, you know what opportunities that this might might open up. And um, uh, Cindy, maybe I'll start with you. Sure. Um... Well, maybe jumping off a little bit the back and forth with you and Dean on the last uh, on the last question, um, you know, I, Medicare is much more prescriptive, for example, in its statute than Medicaid. It's a national program. That federalism concept is not um, is not a feature of the Medicare program. Um, and you know, there are uh, uh, changes in our healthcare system that happen all the time that CMS has to be mindful of as it thinks about its rulemaking. And so one of the things that I think is, is most worrisome and maybe can be addressed by Congress, because you see it in some delegation provisions, I saw one recently with respect to the Social Security Administration, which is that empower the, the secretary to be able to take into account, not arbitrarily, not make things up, you know, how things change over time, right? When, when CMS first issued managed care regulations, managed care was very, very limited, right? And, and, and there was no long-term care in managed care. And there was, you know, a thousand different I issues that didn't exist. And um, you have an agency that is replete with real experts and that is constantly working with the program on the ground. So we cannot ossify the program rules. So I'm worried about that um, and worried that um, we've got to uh, really come, regardless of uh, political direction, we've got to come to some ability to have um, rules evolve and modernize as the world changes without Congress stepping in every five minutes to, to adjust its, its, uh, its statutory pronouncements. Yeah, there's, there's, there's an irony here that, uh... Uh, you know, in an effort to take away power from agencies and, you know, maybe create a more market-based uh, uh, approach to dealing with some of these problems, uh, you sort of lock regulations into uh, a structure that, that may not be relevant anymore. It doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, Lori, Lori, let me turn to you. What what area of, of uh, regulation do, do you think might be particularly vulnerable here? Well, so I think the ACA is an interesting example with preventative services where Congress did delegate how preventative services were going to be figured out to three different agencies. And that is currently being litigated, saying that that was unconstitutional the way it was delegated. And so right now, the Fifth Circuit has ruled that the delegation to USPSTF was not constitutional um, with regard to HRSA and ACIP, but it was OK. But now it's back at the district court. So that litigation, I think, is going to inform potentially how much Congress can delegate. And, you know, that was an example where they saw that the need for preventative services would evolve over time and that they would change. And no one knew that we had COVID. No, you know, things have changed. And so um, that I'm watching that to see how that plays out. And I think there's a instruction there on how much Congress might be able to delegate in the future. Interesting. Uh, and uh, Kate? Um, I guess I would, um, my kind of initial worries are around this very, very long list of regulations that have 
come out over the last decade to stand up the health insurance marketplaces um, from premium tax credit, eligibility to risk adjustment, um, and new rules that come out annually and, and to the extent that they might be vulnerable to challenge for the first time that would upset whole a whole kind of a framework um, for for access to, to coverage. Um, but I should say something optimistic as we get to that end. Um, you know, regulations are, are still going to be a tool um, for implementing the law, and they still have the force of law and, until um, overturned. Um, but agencies also um, have enforcement responsibilities and enforcement tools that can also be used at the same time and May, we may, in fact, see agencies uh, more focused on using those enforcement tools um, to avoid some of the, the regulatory challenges that are ahead. Um, and, and Dean, you get the last word. You can be uh, you can be concerned or or optimistic or or both. Well, I'll, I'll I'll do one of I'll do one of each, and then with all these great questions, you may want to think about a, a sequel here, um, given how much this is going to probably change the the whole balance of power, but. You know, I, I, I guess as somebody who who's seen both sides of regulatory frameworks, I, you know, I think that that you mentioned before, Larry, that some of this is driven by, you know, uh, corporate stakeholders or others. I, I think uh, I view it as much uh, as as a conservative legal doctrine that's been emerging for a long time, with a goal at least of sort of rebalancing. And I think there is a lot of 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 areas that. I, I see, you know, all the time of, of agency overreach. And I think that I, I view that as a positive. I think people have to be more cautious. People have to be more careful and there'll be, uh, I, I think, a greater uh, rebalancing of the three branches of government. I think generally that's a positive thing for our constitutional uh, democracy. And, 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 you know, and with that comes what I'd say is the downside or what I'm concerned about, which is that that creates uncertainty about the future. I'll be interested to see how courts um, decide and what parameters they provide around things like, you know, congressional delegation and how much that solves and how much specificity there needs to be. And th and then I guess maybe just to conclude with where I, I, I kind of think I'm most worried, and Cindy referenced this this term ossified is is I, I worry in areas where it may be uh, in in such a divided country we have now where people may challenge things that they think it's the right thing they feel strongly uh, about it in areas like public health which we haven't talked a lot about today where there's broad delegations of authority that have been provided under federal law you know post uh, 9/11 and 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 other public health authorities um we certainly seen with covid and other things where there may be challenges and the agencies may not be able to move quickly enough or accurately enough uh, or timely enough to to make critical changes or to protect citizens and 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 we've talked a lot about Congress, um, but this gives courts a whole new role. And uh, you know, I I, I I've never clerked uh, before, but I, I I can't imagine that that the clerks are experts in all these different areas that are going to come before them in the federal law, and that that um, sometimes need for speed. And lack of expertise that the courts have, not just the congressional staff, uh, is, is something that I'm going to be watching. And I think right now gives me some initial concern, but hope, but concern. Uh, well, I think that's a perfect place to, to end it. Uh, thank you all for a terrific discussion. I agree with Dean that we uh, we only scratch the surface, and given the the uncertainty here and 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 the scope uh, that we're dealing with, uh, we may very well need to to return to this for, for a sequel. Um, so thanks again. Uh, I learned some things here, which is always, always a good sign. And uh, thanks to the audience uh, for uh, being with us as well. So look for a recording uh, of this uh, later on today. Thanks so much.